Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Anna Maslon and um, I'm representative of uh, not only PEXA but also uh, SGH. I'm, I'm vice president of uh, Polish European Community Study Association and, and also the treasurer. And for me today is a um, special occasion uh, to moderate uh, our panel. So thank you, distinguished guests, that you um, are present here. Uh, let me let me introduce our distinguished speaker. So from my uh, right side, uh, Ms. Olga, uh, mm, I'm sorry for pronunciation, uh, Bogorodetska from University of uh, Warsaw. She's going to present uh, the topic EU soft power sharing democratic values. Um, next um, is Kenneth Ka Lok Chan from Hong Kong Baptist University. And Mr. Kenneth will present Hong Kong calling a critical examination of EU profile during the two, uh, 2019 uh, anti-government protest. Then we have um, Tibor Palankai from Korvinsus University of Budapest. Um, Mr. Tibor will present EU reforms and the nations. And last but not least, Anna Skolimowska from Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University is going to present <coughs> European Union's um, evolving international uh, identity. Um, right, so uh, um, Olga, if I would ask you to start, as we are a bit late, we don't have much time, so please be short, concise. Okay. Thank and the floor so is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy and it's a big honor for me to be here today and present you um, uh, EU soft power sharing democratic values. Actually, I'm working, I guess, uh, last 10 years with the topic of public diplomacy. I feel it's already part of my life and um, Today, uh, I would like to open this topic um, for you with presenting the concept of soft power uh, and how it's work. Um, if we talk about soft power, this concept, um, it was um, coined by Joseph um, nine, um, an American political uh, scholar in the end of uh, 90s, um, uh, but the concept itself uh, started to be uh, implemented actually in the United States of America uh, actually after uh, 11th uh, um, of September after touristic attacks in uh, World Trade Center. So um, soft power. Uh, in European Union actually we have three kinds of powers I would say like normative, transformative and soft power. If you talk about this first one, normative, um, it actually depends, uh, de uh, determines, I'm sorry, norms uh, and standards uh, of EU activities uh, on international stage. If we talk about transformative power, more or less about mecha uh, mechanism uh, of uh, EU influence on third countries. And uh, this Third one, soft power covers economic aspects that led to the growth of EU attraction around the globe. Um, how um, soft power is presented in European Union? It is presented um, mainly at the method by which the attractiveness of the country's ideas and values can be promoted. We have in European Union three different resources of soft power. The first one is European in culture and identity, EU principles and EU institutions. Um, soft power became one of the main concepts on which is based uh, EU foreign policy realization. And what is the main instrument of this soft power realization? Uh, actually, it's public diplomacy. Uh, public diplomacy, I would say, it's 
the way how we influence foreign audience with the aim to form positive opinion about our country, about our society. In my research, actually, I'm not dividing cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, scientific diplomacy, or other kinds of diplomacy. Uh, in general, I present public diplomacy, the main concept that actually include cultural, science, diplomacy, development, diplomacy, sport, and so on. Um, so how actually European Union is attracting, is promoting its values in standards and ideas? First of all, things to people, to people contacts, to networking events, to outreach activities, and empower cultural operators and encourage co collaboration activities. Um, uh, if we talk about the future of use of power, it's more or less presented in my research through the cooperation with non-EU publics and NGOs. Um, there is uh, one of the main documents that actually um, form uh, the idea of um, um, use of power, uh, and this document was um, presented uh, in the uh, EU global strategy that um, presented soft power of EU as a long-term communicational links with different levels of foreign audience from students to business groups, think tanks, to, come, you know, to share common democratic values uh, as uh, intercultural tolerance. So what is the practical level of this use of power realization? What actually we do and what are results of uh, this um, uh, implementing of uh, use of power? So our, um, I'm presenting several programs that are I would say um, most significant uh, according the realization of uh, use of power. First of all, I would like to mention Jean Monnet Dialogue for Peace and Democracy. I would say that it's one of the main programs uh, on uh, uh, helping or providing special consultations for political leaders uh, to build mutual uh, trust and form a democratic uh, parliamentary culture and trust. Uh, Jean Monnet Dialogue for Peace and De Democracy also um, contributes to institutional reform processes uh, and build a platform for dialogue to seek uh, consensus on uh, national priority policies. If uh, we are talking about some examples, such initiatives we are realized uh, common, for example, with Ukrainian parliament and parliament of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Um, I would like to mention uh, uh, also um, not only about Jean Monnet activities, but also about most, I would say, mm, um, famous or most significant um, mm, program that European Union was um, and uh, still realizing is the program of Eastern Partnership. Uh, that was initiated in 2008. Uh, the initiative uh, came from Poland and Sweden. Um, that was aimed on six Eastern uh, European countries, as Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Um, what is the aim of this um, Eastern partnership? Um, actually, the aim to bridge uh, Caucasus and Eastern Europe countries to European standards and to uh, be acquainted with its values and traditions. Um, the Eastern Partnership, I would say it's a kind of manifestation of EU's soft power uh, approach to foreign policy. You know, from one side and from other side, it's an um, approach of attracting foreign governments to join our side through peaceful diplomatic strategies like offering, for example, economic aid um, or appealing to shared values. So who is the leading country now in, um, if you talk about the realization on different um, Eastern uh, of different programs in Eastern Partnership initiative, actually uh, it was and still remains 
according to my research, uh, Poland. Poland, uh, for Poland, this um, program of Eastern Partnership was important you know, from one side uh, to um, have a new position in the European Union. And from one side, Poland is a good example for Eastern Partnership countries uh, in, uh, in uh, development, in, uh, in uh, economic, democratic, and political transformations after joining the European Union. Um, still, today, we faced uh, a lot of challenges in the um, uh, area of Eastern Partnership countries, and a lot of scholars and politicians are saying that this Eastern Partnership program is actually not effective. Nothing has happened. Countries are staying practically on the same level that they have been before um, this initiative. But I would not agree with this point. I would say yes, there are a lot of challenges. First of all, one of the biggest challenge is uh, Russia's foreign policy to towards uh, neighboring countries. And of course, um, use of power still remains uh, weak uh, against uh, Ru uh, Russian uh, hard power in the region of um, Eastern Partnership uh, countries. But still, we have a lot of positive changes. And uh, thank you. Uh, a lot of positive changes in um, countries of uh, Eastern Partnership. For example, I will give you some, um, uh, uh, some projects that were realized uh, during um, uh, recent years. For example, more than 10,000 of students from Eastern Partnership countries um, have been studying in uh, uh, European Union and um, took part uh, in, uh, for example, Erasmus Plus program. More than uh, 30,000 young people and students um, took uh, part in different um, programs for students and academic staff exchange programs. Now, also we have visible uh, improvements in trade connections between EU and uh, six countries of Eastern Partnership. Um, EU policy based on the principles of soft power according to Eastern Partnership countries brought there a lot of uh, transformations and due to numerous consultations, due to numerous conferences, due to numerous, uh, I would say, uh, forming different uh, democratic inst institutions in those countries, we see some positive improvements. Also, uh, for example, uh, ESAD declaration systems we have uh, set up in Armenia, Georgia, Republic of Moldova, and Ukraine. We have improvements in civil service laws paved uh, the way towards a more uh, depoliticized civil service in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Republic of Moldova, and Ukraine. So as a conclusion, what I would like to mention that maybe uh, use of power is still not so strong comparing to those challenges that have appeared in this region of Eastern Partnership countries. But still there are a lot of positive transformations uh, in uh, this region. And first of all, uh, I would say that uh, maybe the strategy that European Union have chosen according to those countries is not actually the right one nowadays. Maybe uh, the concept should be transformed more to the idea of smart power. Smart power that is actually a mix of soft and hard power. Maybe it will be the best solution for EU to form its foreign policy according to the region, for example, of Eastern Partnership countries. Thank you so much for attention. for giving us um, insight for um, soft power and sharing democracy values. And now I would ask uh, Professor Skolimowska to share with us her presentation about European Union's evolving international identity, which is here. So, thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much for the possibility to share with you some ideas that uh, I find very interesting uh, to speak about when it comes to European Union's international identity. Uh, the previous speaker gave us an input into the one of the very popular definition of the European Union's international ad uh, identity as a soft power. In my um, contribution, allow me to present you um, um, another way of thinking about the European Union's uh, self-definition and self-perception in the international uh, relation, as well as allow me to give you a um, hypothesis that um, current uh, self-definitions whatever it is, a soft power, normative power, and so on, are uh, in a process of a deep reconstruction or even deconstruction. The speaker said a minute ago that a soft power is not sufficient to, to describe all the activities undertaken by the European Union. And let me add one more thing, that it is not expected when it comes to the uh, international environment for the European Union to be so much soft power, rather to seek another way, another possibility and another tools that could enhance her um, policies, her um, strategies and actions undertaken uh, around the world. Um, my um, contribution will be divided in the three or will be uh, touching three general uh, issues. First of all, the identity issue as such, as a um, very useful concept, theoretical concept developed within the international relations theory as well as uh, uh, within European studies uh, scholars um, uh, that will allow us to um, organize our way of thinking about the specificity of European Union's um, international uh, actions and so on. The second element will touch uh, internal character of and internal specificity of uh, the uh, discourse of uh, uh, about European Union's international identity and the hypothesis um, that is um, related to this issue is that uh, internal discourse on EU's um, self-definition and self um, self-definition of her identity is under the uh, reconstructions in is in the process of seeking a new forms of uh, definition and new forms of uh, uh, um, ways of thinking about her uh, international involvement. And the third element, let me uh, introduce you some general remarks when it comes to the image of Europe, image of the European Union that she has in the eyes of um, important others. It is the sociological concept of identity that the identity of actor is not only his own um, self-perception, but it is uh, also um, um, a mirror, a kind of mirror of uh, thinking about uh, one's identity that is presented or shared by others. Um, so, um, as I've told you at the beginning, the first issue when it comes to this topic um, is uh, an identity issue. I was trying to put in my uh, research an identity issue as it is um, developed by constructivist scholars and very important uh, for uh, the process of understanding of European Union's international identity is the um, Mm -hmm. uh, statement given by the constructivist scholars that identity is not um, stable as such, um, that uh, this is a um, uh, very processual phenomenon um, attributed to actors of international um, relations that is developed in the interactions with others 
and that is uh, developed in internal discourse of uh, important actors involved in a process of, um, in this case, creating um, foreign and external policy of the European Union. So um, just to sum up this theoretical reflection uh, related to identity issue, the scholars who are very important to this topic is prominent uh, constructivist scholar Alexander Wendt and his vision of collective identity formation in the international um, um, state. Um, so um, this uh, way of thinking about the identity as something that is not given uh, for once, it is something very changeable, uh, it is something very um, under the process of uh, social construction. Um, so just to, to, to give us some uh, important elements, identity is constructed and therefore dependent on the agents that construct it. Um, identity is a dynamic concept, rests on a tradition. As we are thinking about European uh, identity, we cannot uh, skip the element of history, of European heritage and so on. Um, also, identity sustains a close relation to the system of political values, as I've told you, and is based on drawing borders, producting in group and out group basis. Um, we've been talking, and uh, the scholars were trying to find an answer when using this constructivist way of thinking about the identity, what kind of identity we can attribute to the European Union and a very popular way of thinking uh, about uh, the definition of European Union's um, uh, international identity is a concept of normative power as developed by Manners in 2002. And uh, this uh, concept is um, uh, putting our attention uh, into those elements um, like peace, liberty, democracy, rule of law, human rights, a value system that is in heart of European attractiveness, um, powerness, um, and identity in the international relations. And I was trying to um, ask a question if it is um, truly the normative power concept that is shared among uh, political allies uh, within uh, the political system of the European Union when speaking and thinking about her uh, international identity, uh, identity and if uh, this way of thinking about Europe's uh, identity is shared by others, by others, um, I mean uh, other group of states or states in the international relations and you can see um, the way of uh, spreading uh, this uh, way of, uh, or communicating this way of um, a normative identity by the European uh, institutions um, like it was described or like it was um, said by um, Ian Manners, a constructivist scholar. scholar. Um, <clears throat> Let me, because we do not have much time, skip the theoretical element of, of the survey I'm conducting and to give you only a conclusion when it comes to this uh, normative uh, power concept that this is a very, from the theoretical point of view, very dangerous and um, sometimes tricky um, paradigm to use when describing uh, normative power Europe. It lacks methodological consistency and so on. So we as scholars, we should be very critical when referring to the normative power concept, soft power concept, as, um, and treat them in a more realistic, when it comes to positivist um, way of thinking about science and the way of describing reality by using those uh, elements. Um, so, in the internal um, uh, discourse of European Union's um, international identity, the normative power concept was very popular, um, as we know, but uh, under the many events and many crises that, were, um, uh, that, the, European Union, uh, that the European project faced, uh, this uh, normative uh, concept is in the process of evolution. The European Union is trying to redefine or to find other tools to describe her normative uh, identity and is trying to avoid uh, nowadays a normative, it, uh, normative language. 
we can um, see this evolution in the documents like Shared Vision Common Action Strategy, where values and those elements that were um, uh, attributed to normative power concept are diminishing or vanished, were uh, replaced by, by a language that is um, related to a more pragmatic, realistic way of uh, speaking and thinking about European Union's uh, international identity. When it comes to the um, when it comes to the external image and the question if others important, important others are perceiving the European Union as a normative actor, the survey showed us uh, or verified this hypothesis in a negative sense. It means that the um, other actors of international relations do not share this European popular self-definition as a normative uh, power for many reasons. Some of them were pointed here, but the most um, three important, in my opinion, uh, are related, first of all, to history of Europe's involvement in the world. Um, its colonial past and imperial um, experience is a huge obstacle to build a credible image of Europe as an, a neutral um, or a very positive um, uh, norm-based actor in the international relations. Uh, the second element is related to the issues um, of her uh, foreign policy that is very fragmented, um, despite some um, efforts undertaken in the Lisbon Treaty, uh, Treaty of Lisbon to improve this element, still it is not um, a very um, uh, strong um, instrument um, uh, for the European Union in the international relations. The third element is related uh, to um, uh, the case of um, uh, the political model that the European Union is offering um, uh, with the, uh, within the normative identity uh, policies. And it is not so exceptional when it comes to the tools undertaken by other actors. Uh, for example, United States or institutions like the United Nations are having the same goals in the international relations to preserve peace, democracy, rule of law, and so on. So European uniqueness in this kind is not so exceptional, let me say. Um, there are also many competitors when it comes to European Union's international um, actions within the normative uh, power paradigm. Like I've told you, the United States, even the Chinese policy is also orientated towards spreading some specific um, uh, values that uh, might be um, called uh, universal in some uh, way. Um, so um, as my time is probably over, um, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak um, and to share with you some general um, ideas uh, related to the uh, evolution of European Union's international identity, and if uh, I would be given some question, I would be delighted, and um, thank you very much one more time. Thank you, Prof, especially that you stick to the time, and I didn't have to <laughs> speed you up. Uh, thank you so much. And now, um, uh, Professor Chan from Hong Kong, Baptist U um, University. Uh, Hong Kong perspective, uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong calling. As far as I know, you don't have presentation. Just, okay, just thank you very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kenneth Chen from Hong Kong, based at Hong Kong Baptist University. I'm also the president of the Hong Kong Association for European Studies. So this is a case study focusing on Hong Kong and how the European Union has performed as far as Hong Kong's situation is concerned. Of course, uh, as I'm speaking, the situation in Hong Kong is still not totally stabilized. It's very volatile. As most of you might be paying attention to the situation in Hong Kong and wondering how I still managed to leave Hong Kong to come to this conference. So I appreciate really your uh, kind acceptance uh, uh, of my paper and uh, give me the time to do more um, uh, to prepare better for that. The European Union, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, has claimed to be a promoter of norms as standards of behavior in the international system. I suppose a lot of people here have read about the EU's global strategy 
of 2016, of which, if I may, I quote, without global norms and a means to enforce them, peace and security, prosperity, and democracy, our vital interests are at risk. The EU will lead by example on global governance, but it cannot deliver alone. It will act as agenda setter, a connector, coordinator, and facilitator within a networked web of players. Fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. That's the slogan we hear a lot these days in the streets of Hong Kong. So to what extent has the European Union responded to that slogan? The evolving protests have succeeded, of course, in capturing global attention, generating considerable interest in just opposing Hong Kong with the opposition of movements and, and movements elsewhere. Um, Hong Kong people like to say that what's happening in Hong Kong nowadays is not merely another epic story of David versus Goliath, but arguably a harbinger to, of things to come for countries dealing with an increasingly assertive People's Republic of China. So what follows would be a very simple, um, I would say, an inquiry into how ready the EU has fulfilled its roles as a global actor through a partnership with like-minded inhabitants in Hong Kong and uh, through norm diffusion, perhaps. And also, we'd like to ask um, the prospects of a strategic partnership between EU and Hong Kong through norm diffusion. And more specifically, what has the EU done during the protests in Hong Kong so far? Has the EU considered the relevance of the norms and standards to the evolving situation, and what channels and mechanisms has the European Union employed to make known its position over Hong Kong? And last but not least, how could the EU's intervention be legitimized within the remit of the one country, two systems policy? The European Union and Hong Kong are strategic partners, so to speak. Uh, as a matter of fact, EU28, or 28 countries combined, has long been Hong Kong's second largest trade partner after the People's Republic of China. The EU is known, recognized by Hong Kong people, mostly through its economic power, more than its political positioning. Um, but be that as it may, a lot of Hong Kong people still consider the EU as a natural partner because of well, proximity of ideas, values, and norms after all, Hong Kong had been a British colony for more than a century. And the whole idea of one country, two systems, the policy itself, has been meant to protect Hong Kong as a different special administrative region, preserving those core values, preserving institutions, underpinning those values. Values in Hong Kong, uh, those values in Hong Kong are known as universal values. So what happened since uh, the beginning of the protests this year? The European Union appears to be quite active, I would say, um, moving away from those ordinary conventional expressions about concerning the situation in Hong Kong. The EU has been rather proactive. No less than seven statements, seven statements have been issued. And also the European Parliament adopted a resolution as well in July. Now for reasons of time, I don't have a lot of time to read, your, read, your, read, read out all the uh, uh, statements or resolutions, just to sample perhaps the one from the 13th of June this year, it says, I quote, the European Union shares many of the concerns raised by citizens of Hong Kong regarding the government's proposed extradition reforms and has conveyed these to the government. This is a sensitive issue with potentially far-reaching consequences for Hong Kong as, and its people, for EU and foreign citizens, as well as for business confidence in Hong Kong. An in-depth, inclusive public consultation we help to find a constructive way forward. We look to the government to engage in such a dialogue with its citizens. Now that's mid-June, of course. Uh, the situation has um, developed, I would say, from bad to worse as the government refused to listen to the people uh, to conduct a proper public consultation on this very controversial piece of legislation or amendment to the existing piece of legislation known as the extradition law, whereby any Hong Kong citizen might be extradited to the People's Republic of China for so-called justice. Now, moving on quickly, if I may, for reasons of time, uh, just a few weeks ago, on the 18th of November, there was a declaration made by the High Representative on behalf of the EU 
on Hong Kong. Let me briefly to quote, actions by law enforcement authorities must remain strictly proportionate, while fundamental freedoms, including the right to peaceful assembly of Hong Kongers, must be upheld. Only confidence-building measures, including an inclusive and sincere dialogue, reconciliation, and community engagement, can lead to a sustainable solution a comprehensive inquiry into the violence, use of force, and the root causes of the protests is a critical element in de-escalation efforts. The EU is willing to support all those who would work towards de-escalation and establishing such a dialogue. So by and large, the EU has proven to be not only an informed actor in Hong Kong, but also one that's willing to inform others what it thinks. However, if we do consider Hong Kong to be a testing ground of the EU's human rights and democracy policy, I believe there's new room for development of a strategic partnership with like-minded inhabitants in Hong Kong. Now, so far, the EU's position has been self-limiting if I may be blunt and honest about that, and therefore has prevented itself from rising to the challenge. The EU has been talking a lot about de-escalation, peace making, confidence building, investigation inquiries, and so on and so forth, but increasingly, given the situation in Hong Kong nowadays, it, it looks as like increasingly it's speaking to thin air, because Hong Kong has become so polarized between the authorities on the one hand and the opposition on the other hand. And the EU is now risking, by trying to stand in the middle, falling between two stools. Its relevance is at risk to the, to the increasingly uh, severe and volatile situation. Up to this moment, 5,856 people of Hong Kong have been arrested this year alone. And 20% of those arrested are aged between 18 and 20, very young, very brave. And 31% of those between 21 and 25 years old. So is it enough just to speak truth to power, issuing those statements and telling people to calm down and de-escalate? Not at all. It's not enough at all. Hong Kong people are calling for a more sort of proactive approach because the struggle in Hong Kong with an increasingly aggressive China should tell the rest of the world what to expect. And Hong Kong may serve as well as a platform in the Asia Pacific region to promote EU's uh, human rights agenda in accordance with um, its proclaimed values, but also with universally agreed international norms and laws as well, such as the paragraph that I cited at the beginning of my, of my paper uh, from the 2016 EU Global strategy. Be that as it may, uh, I think by and large people in Hong Kong are still very appreciative of what the EU has done, what the EU has said, but more would need to be done in order to address the situation adequately. So to, in answering the, 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 the two big questions and the four, and the four uh, sub-questions that I put forward at the beginning of my uh, uh, paper this, this afternoon, I think the EU has done everything addressing concerns, um, making its positions known, willing to engage and willing to inform. But at the end of the day, I think people in Hong Kong do now expect more. Now, the good news, of course, for those who are uh, fans of the European Union here, the EU is no longer, as far as Hong Kong people and, of course, the People's Republic of China are concerned, no longer an UPO, an identified political object. But just exactly how this political object is going to move how is it going to address the situation in Hong Kong um, beyond moving beyond those uh, statements, moving beyond the resolutions? I think we need more action. Now, a fine example may, may as well be some kind of a Human Rights and Democracy Act that Washington, D.C. has just adopted. Now, this is quite important as far as Hong Kong is concerned because people, are, people in Hong Kong are saying, for our freedom and yours, or just like in the case of Polish history, we all know that there was, during the Second World War, for your freedom and ours, right? So this is the critical moment. It's a very, very important moment that we have to reckon with. Uh, for a lot of Hong Kong people, this is already our end game, even beyond 2047, before the end of the so-called one country, two systems uh, policies expiry date. 
So if European Union and EU people in general we think that we still have time, we can still talk about one country, two systems. I think it's really time to reassess the situation with the help of Hong Kong activists. For us, it's a very critical moment. There's always a chance that Hong Kong will degenerate rapidly into another Xinjiang or Tibet. And if that actually happens, if, you, that, if that is allowed to happen, it will be already too late. Thank you very much for your kind attention. the insight how the EU is perceived by the Hong Kong people. And now, um, please, Professor Pankai, uh, share with us your presentation and your insights into EU reforms. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, invitation. And uh, if you allow me just a few personal views, uh, words, uh, about this invitation. Uh, my first uh, visit to Poland was 60, uh, 76, so 43 years ago. And uh, I went to Poznan for a conference, so I stopped in Warsaw and uh, happened to I don't know why I, uh, we had to, which my colleague had to spend one nine, night in Warsaw. So we wanted to uh, have a hotel here. And uh, we went to the nearest uh, hotel from the railway station, uh, Metropole, and, and asked for a room. And the lady told that Sorry, you know, we have booked, we have been booked for, 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 for a year. And I happened to mention that we are Hungarian. And she said, Hungarian? That's, that's, wait 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, you know, we got, we got a room. So that's the Polish Hungarian <laughs> friendship. Since that, I, I uh, was at several conferences, you know. Wroclaw, uh, uh, Szczecin, Dance, Krakow, Woods, uh, Karpacz. I had always very good impressions about and good memories about, about uh, Poland. Well, about the uh, topic. Uh, it is about, uh, you know, a new stage of uh, EU integration. And in this uh, respect, uh, the new position of nations in the integration process. And this new stage is uh, of two uh, components. One is that the EU is unique in the sense that it, it is only uh, integration group which has a almost complete uh, single market and a, 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 you know, a currency union, a, a, a economic and, and monetary union. There is no such other uh, integration grouping. The other uh, exclu exclusivity of, of the EU is a very high level of integratedness. And uh, just again, I uh, some personal remark that in the last 20 years, I did research on measuring uh, European integration. And the first uh, attempt was about measuring uh, integration maturity in the early 90s, how far we are prepared for, for integration. And uh, that, of course, was interesting. Finally, it turned out that the enlargement was a political question. And, uh, not much attention was given. Of course, of course, we had to fulfill the basic criteria, but 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 the priority was finally given for for political uh, aspect. Uh, the other research, uh, which in fact failed uh, in the last few years, was about periphery, centrum and periphery, and uh, uh, we tried to measure the distance of of the periphery from, from, the, from the central countries, the core countries. And we sorted out about 20 something parameters, not just the per capita GDP, but 
per capita telephone and the internet use and lots of lots of others and to try to measure the distance. Is the distance increasing or is the distance uh, closing? And uh, in a tentative, you know, uh, stage, we concluded that, uh, and, and uh, the <clears throat> uh, lecture of, of uh, Ms. Mesaros told the same, that uh, uh, we became uh, part of the core. So the periphery became internal, but we remain periphery because the, per, the, 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 the distances in, in, in different, uh, you know, directions remained. And we distinguished, you know, near periphery, that's uh, Romania, Bulgaria, the external periphery like Ukraine and the far periphery, you know, like Vietnam. But finally this research failed because I failed to uh, recruit the enough people this, you know, would mean lots of data analysis and, and, and quite expensive, and I failed to raise the money, so, so simply, simply I gave up. But uh, another research which was partly more successful, that was about the integration profile. And that was really about uh, the level of the state and the level of integratedness. And in this respect, we, besides the uh, institutional and regulatory uh, sphere, we try to focus on real integration in terms of trade intensity, in terms of interconnectedness, interdependence, uh, capital relation, flow of, flow of labor, structural uh, relations, structural con convergence, and so on. And we uh, created five clusters in this sense on a 100% 100, 100 you know, scale. And we told that up to 10% there is no integration. The 10% is a certain sort of, of uh, uh, threshold, dependence threshold of integration th threshold. If, if you know the foreign trade is less than 10% of GDP, or if the, our integration trade is less than 10% of the total trade, then there is no integration. And, and then we uh, took the 30 to 50% as a low integration, 50 to 7 high integration, uh, uh, excuse me, 30, uh, 30, uh, 10 to 30 low integration, 30 to 50 uh, medium integration, 50 to 70 high, and above 70 extremely high integration. And we concluded uh, that. Uh, 20, uh, uh, 20 countries from the 29 are on the high integration level. So above this 50% level, and there are the highly developed countries like Benelux uh, countries, uh, Ireland, Austria, and uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Slovakia, which belong to the extremely high integrated, so above 70%. And Poland is uh, not different in this sense, but we fail to filter out the size of the country, you know, in terms of, in terms of data, the shares are uh, lower in case of, in case of, of a larger country. And in this respect, uh, you know, we try to filter out this, this uh, problem, but, but uh, it it's, it's was not really successful. And this means that even the high countries are very highly integrated, and, and the lower percentage is just because of their size. And it means that, for example, Britain is a highly integrated country. And it means that if you look at institutional terms, you can say that, okay, you leave, I don't like, you know, uh, Brussels gives, you know, instructions and so we don't like Brussels, we, we simply leave the country. But if you look from real integration aspect, then it's, it simply turns out that, that uh, the only option is remain, only uh, positive option is remain in, and, and, and leaving, the, leaving the union means 
uh, growing uh, costs, growing sacrifices, and a first option than staying inside. And we felt that this type of analysis somehow was missing in terms of, for example, the Brexit problems. And it's, uh, you know, it's particularly the case with, with, with Hungary. You know, sometimes the hexit comes up, but these people don't know what they talk about because, because simply it's Britain couldn't step out, leave the country, leave the Union. So it's, it's really a, an irrational assumption. <clears throat> but uh, going further, this means that, that uh, we have a new stage of development uh, in integration uh, from the 90s. And what is important and what I want to talk about is that it's changed the position of the nations. And it means that the external integration has, uh, you know, repercussions for internal economy, and it uh, calls for a really substantial adjustment, substantial transformation, internal transformation. And it has uh, two, uh, you know, dimensions. One is structural. Uh, the economies should structurally, uh, you know, adjust, and it means a policy, a regulatory adjustment, and which means that in terms of multi-level governance, we have a situation that the, the regulation of integration process has two, two legs. One is the national level of regulation, and one is uh, uh, the union level of regulation. And the two has to be uh, in harmony because if you know, don't uh, harmonize the steps, you can easily fa fall down. And this brings uh, the, the nation's positions in a new dimension. It means that many respect the national policies, the national integration is upgraded. It's strange that you know, we have a progress in, in uh, integration and we have a progress in terms of, of for example, federal direction, but uh, the national policies remain uh, important and the national policies the nas national uh, policies had to, had to uh, adjust and we need a certain sort of new type of national relations, a cooperative type, an open and competitive type of, of relation and really what is outdated in the national policies is the confrontative type of policies, it's a, uh, exclusive policies, discriminatory policies and so on. All right, I think that uh, uh, we have to... I have a PowerPoint for one hour. So, 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 so sorry, but I have to jump over. And uh, uh, really one, very shortly, one point about, you know, what sort of adjustments we, we need in different fields. And what I want to stress very shortly that really the national attitudes should focus on competitiveness and convergence, and the only way to achieve this, this is the maximum exploitation of, of uh, uh, you know, advantages of integration. Uh, I uh, just make two uh, points. Uh, among many others, and that is the integration of small and medium-sized medium enterprises. Uh, this is the point where our integration is in deficit. We have, due to foreign investments, you know, ha highly, at least in, in Hungary, you know, Mercedes and others are highly competitive. The productivity level, the efficiency level is the same as in, in the core countries. So in this respect, uh, we, uh, we are all right. 
But as far as our small and medium type of enterprises are concerned, their level of profit, uh, you know, uh, uh, competitiveness is not satisfactory. We made a, a study on that and probably 10% of Hungarian small and uh, medium sized enterprises are, are competitive and, and can use the uh, opportunities of, of uh, uh, the integration. This is 70% in Germany. So this, this is really a, a high uh, deficit in, in uh, integration. I just mentioned in the paper, I uh, tried to make a point about, about two-speed Europe, multi-speed Europe, the federal future, and so on. Probably just one uh, remark, that the present construction, single market, monetary union, was made uh, before we stepped into the Union. It was made by the 12, really the 12 countries, but largely on the 15 countries. But our entry changed the Union. And really, I'm afraid that the, the rules and, and the conditions were not changed accordingly. So, so we need reform, no, no question, no one questions. But I think that we need to be active in this reform in the future. And we have to fight for, for take into account the new situation or the situation uh, or problems of these countries. Thank you very much. We don't have any time. Uh, for <laughs> there is one question. <laughs> OK. so. Uh, just one question as we need to finish our session. So please, just. Yeah. Uh, I have a question to Professor. Uh, I have in the next session uh, the, the presentation paper uh, title is Religion in the Populist Discourse Regarding the Admission of Immigrants and Refugees from Muslim Countries. And I um, read a lot of, lot of books uh, about uh, populism. And uh, in these books, uh, different authors, uh, Hungary uh, are on the top. And uh, the policy which Orban is doing, according to this author, uh, it, it is very, very dangerous to take uh, Hungary and this part of Europe, this uh, Visegrad countries from the European Union. And <laughs> it's very interesting that you didn't mention uh, this kind of uh, situation uh, in, in your speech. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about your point. What's. what's, what's... No, in my comments. Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly, thank you for all the presentations. I have a comment and then the question to um, Olga Bagarecka. Thank you for your presentation coming from Azerbaijan. I'm kind of, uh, let's say, exposed to the Eastern neighborhood policy. And uh, just before uh, going to my question, I would love to add about Poland's pioneering for this policy, um, also from the point of view of uh, easy mobility and movement, because uh, the Eastern neighbors was always the, let's say, the easy uh, movement for Poland, spe specifically Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, a lot of migration to Poland, and also historically, you know, having a lot of uh, mutual, let's say, history, like among the um, among these countries, and also about the declaration to entrust a job to a foreigner that you know uh, gives easy access to labor market for these migra migrants uh, coming from these uh, countries. My question is about the um, the measurement of effectiveness of Eastern neighborhood policy. Like, uh, do you have any evidence, or is there any research since the establishment of the Eastern neighborhood policy? Is there any changes um, observed uh, between these countries? 
because, you know, the situations are different in each country. So <laughs> I don't know how much the EU is able to change some things uh, like by means of these kind of tools. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for your question and for your comment. Um, actually, I would like to mention that Eastern Partnership Program um, is one of the most successful if we are talking uh, from the side of Eastern Partnership countries. Maybe if we are talking from the side of the European Union, it's maybe not the most successful and maybe not the uh, most significant program. But if you're talking from the side, from Eastern Partnership countries, especially Azerbaijan, beautiful country, I've just come back from this beautiful uh, state, uh, I would like uh, to say that uh, two countries that uh, succeeded the most in this program, it's uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, if you're talking about evaluation, yes, uh, of um, uh, this Eastern Partnership Program, or how we can estimate, yes, the positive or negative uh, results of implementing this program. In uh, uh, 2016, uh, there was um, uh, such an initiative which was called EU Strat, like a kind of uh, explanation or initiative uh, that was aimed uh, to evaluate the uh, effectiveness of uh, Eastern Partnership. Uh, this initiative should be finished in the end of uh, 2018 and we will see what they will say. Now, my predictions uh, regarding this uh, program that uh, we have associate agreements, yes, with the uh, several of the countries, so it will be, I guess, the biggest plus. Uh, the countries that are mm, uh, not, I would say, succeeding in this program, actually, it's Belarus and uh, less, I would say, Azerbaijan. The biggest problems that are appearing um, uh, in those societies is, of course, corruption and the level Yes, um, of willing of politicians to um, change, to develop uh, their countries. And um, I would say that this document, EU Strat, if you're interested in um, results or estimating the effectiveness of uh, Eastern Partnership uh, Program, we can check in the end of 2019 what they have prepared. It's EU Strat is like... Um, uh, an initiative of uh, different politicians, scholars, that uh, are actually in investigating this problem and evaluating the effectiveness on uh, Eastern Partnership. From my side, I would say that being in all of those six uh, countries of Eastern Partnership, um, uh, I've been noticing that Poland is doing the most. I'm not saying that in other uh, EU countries are not engaged in this program, but I've seen um, the biggest involvement of Poland. Starting from conferences, finishing with cultural events of Polish institutes. And um, I would say that um, the program of Eastern Partnership, it's um, more important now for Ukraine and Georgia, I guess. Belarus is the country that is less involved. From perspective of Azerbaijan, I think that now the political situation is not so clear. Maybe when it will be more clear, it will be easier for us to estimate do actually Azerbaijan people want to move on and to have um, the associate agreement with European Union. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Olga. And I think that uh, the time of our session just expired <laughs> and we are just uh, over the time. So now thank you uh, so much. And I would ask uh, uh, the second panel, panelists to come here as there's no breaks between those panels. Uh, so thank you so much. And all, yeah. thank you, Klaus. Thank you.
Is it working? Yes. Great. Um, hello again. Thank you for staying. I know that it's a bit challenging time just before the lunch, but thank you for your commitment. It's highly appreciated. Um, now we are going to have the next panel with our speakers. Um, just not to lose the time, so we'll continue. Uh, the first speaker is Rebecca Kerr. She is coming from uh, Queen's University in Belfast, and she's going to present about the Social Democratic Party's electoral strategies and social class remobilization. So, Rebecca, you can start. Okay, great. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Rebecca Kerr and I am a third year PhD student at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. So today I'm going to be talking about Social Democratic Party's electoral strategies amid social class and social cleavage realignment. Um, so in order to address this research topic, I use the case study countries of uh, the UK. So I use the Labour Party in the UK case and then I compare it to the SPD in the German case. So I use comparative analysis and I use uh, qualitative interviews as a way of, of comparing the two case study countries. Okay, so just some theory first. I'm sure everyone here knows what social class and what social cleavage is, but just very quickly. Social cleavage in the context of this research is to do with partisan ties between different groups within society. Um, the social class is more of the economic, so based on factors such as occupation, even uh, educational uh, degree classification as a mode of um, defining whether an individual is in, say, for example, higher class, middle class, and a lower class. Um, as this presentation goes on, you see how that has very much so changed in recent times, but these are how it's more uh, traditionally conceived. Um, so I deal a lot with the idea of the social consciousness class, which is very separate from the material class. So the material class, the idea of material class is again the idea of, in a way, how much money do you have is on those traditional socioeconomic factors such as occupation, um, education, whereas the shared construction of social reality and the social consciousness class is very much so rooted in identity formations. So it's rooted in um, a commonality in terms of that identity, what formed the identity structure, and how that actually leads into the ideas of class voting and how individuals vote for their political uh, parties. Okay. okay, so obviously we've gone through a um, big process of deindustrialization. Um, so this has led to the disintegration of working class culture. And by working class culture, I mean those uh, groups in society where traditionally in the UK case anyways, more industrial towns, maybe individuals who worked in industries in that sort of um, sphere of environment. And on the back of this, there has been this huge growth of post-materialism, and post-materialism in this context refers to post-modern values, so issues such as gender, race, um, ideas of the environment as well, so how post-modern values are actually taking a more of importance to those individuals in comparison to, say, for example, um, again, the idea of occupational status. And this has been on the back of the expansion of technology and the expansion of education and on the expansion of, importantly, globalization. So say, for example, between the start of the 1970s and then the end of the 1980s, uh, the growth of post-materialists in British society uh, grew threefold. And then in comparison for Germany for the same period of time, they actually grew fourfold where post-materialists actually uh, became more numerous in society over those individuals who had more traditional 
um, conceptions of um, society and who did not have the same sort of levels of post-material values, so just for some comparison. Um, so this has led to big questions for um, a social democratic parties because as social democratic parties usually have their voter bases in more of that traditionally conceived working class cohorts. So moving forward, when there was the acknowledgement that okay, this group in society is actually shrinking, so who are we going to appeal to? Who do we want to actually attract to our parties? So this has led to big questions for social democratic parties. So on the, well, on your left there, we have some kind of brief history. I won't spend too much time in it just because I'm aware of time constraints for the Labour Party in the UK. And then alternatively on the other side there is for the SPG in Germany. So it just shows the evolution and their movement towards uh, more moderate policies. And this was mostly in a bid to attract the median voter. So there has been a movement away from actually trying to get that uh, traditionally conceived working class voter and it moved to the more medium voter, the middle class voter, who had more uh, concerns with regards to um, investment in education rather than, say, uh, workers' rights in factories or in mines, for example. Yeah. Okay, so this led to these two, which is Tony Blair of the Labour Party and Jared Schroeder, apologies if any German speakers are here, my pronunciation is not fantastic, of the SPD. So these two guys here combined um, to, to create this... Um, the idea of the third way, um, Dainu Mitta. Um, so they brought their parties, the Labour Party and the SPD, towards the electoral centre in a bid to again attract that median voter. Um, and this led to a big disenfranchisement of the working class voters. So there was a bit of a um, defection, issues of defections there were actually okay. Um, where people felt let down by their political parties, people felt like betrayed as in a way. Um, so in the German case, this led to the formation of the Alternative for Work and Social Justice movement. Um, I mean, you had a lot of pushback as well from like more staunch leftists within the party who did not actually um, advocate for these moves towards the centre, um, which at times led for quite um, damaging effects for the working class, particularly the Hartz reforms in the German case. Okay. So this uh, comes to the radical right-wing parties. So the radical right-wing parties growth, the UKIP in the British case again, and then the AFD in the German case. So these parties and groups came about on the backlash of the modernization process, the backlash of the globalization process. As I said, these working class voters felt very disenfranchised by those social democratic parties' moves towards the moderate center. And as a result, you've seen these parties here grow quite steadily. So Pippa Norris, uh, Ronald Inglehart, um, have this book released last year, The Backlash Effect, which is, um, it really draws attention to these sort of issues. Um, the, the rise of radical right-wing parties is associated with the rise of nationalism. Um, people have very much so campaigned against immigration, um, and this is as a backlash to that idea of globalization, which Tony Blair and George Schroeder very much so tried to advocate in the German, the British case, that actually these cohorts in society were not happy with these sort of moves towards globalization and modernization. So this led to this kind of polarization within British and German society. Okay, so in responding to this realignment, um, the UK case study I'll talk about here. So the UK case study is quite interesting as um, Brexit is also in the mix, obviously. But um, so in the UK case, there has been this move towards cleavages, which are separate from that traditional uh, material class voting sort of identifications and towards a sort of partisan um, identities. So people who identify as being um, say, for example, pro-EU, postmodern, and versus the alternative, which is a bit more um, traditional, a bit more nationalistic. So it's led to these very much so two enfranchised uh, groups in society at odds with each other. So the Labour Party has a task because they want to essentially keep a lot of their old working class voters who would be traditionally associated with the Labour Party, but they also want to gain new voters. They want to gain the post-materials. They want to gain the post-modern vo voters, the, um, the youth, the students. Um, so in their movement to do so, um, Ed Miliband was elected in 2015 as their leader. Um, he gained only 30.4% um, and given the structure of the British uh, voting system, that's quite poor in um, the general election in 2015. So he was dubbed a red right Ed because he was seen as a bit more socialist than previous leaders, but he did not resonate very well with the electorate. 
And moving on to the last general election, 2017, it was obviously by Jeremy Corbyn, who was the leader of the Labour Party, and they experienced quite a surge, up to 40% in 2017. And he did very, very well at attracting students, attract, attracting those individuals who are that kind of post-materialist cohort within society. So these are just some quotes I took from some of my interviews, which just demonstrate that actually the Labour Party and the SVD um, both have a very big problem in terms of their electoral dilemma and in terms of which direction they actually need to bring the party in in order to remain um, respected and remain, you know, kind of as a valid option to the British electorate. So there's just some quotes picked out there. I won't go through and read them all individually. But um, I interviewed individuals in policy, in more left-wing factions of the Labour Party, more moderate factions as well, and they all kind of give back this same image that, yeah, we acknowledge that there is a big electoral dilemma here, and we don't really know who we should actually be trying to target. So, just for the process, this is just a short presentation, but the two main sort of options, or two main sort of um, themes, I suppose, that came out of the interviews was that some individuals within the Labour Party believe that socialism is the answer, so that you have to very much so adopt those postmodern, those post-materialist values as a way to actually encourage people to vote for the party. And um, so, again, there's just um, some quotes there. They're usually from more leftists within the party, so individuals who would have been involved in trade unions, who would have been involved in momentum, more kind of left-wing factions and Marxist, Marxist factions within the party. And then you have the alternative, the more moderates in the party, who really came about during the Tony Blair era, who feel that um, the party will not succeed at all um, under a more socialist sort of platform, and that actually they need to adhere to a more moderate or to a more centrist uh, position in order to actually become and to remain a viable political force within the UK. Um, so there's been a lot of pushback, particularly for um, the current leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who has more kind of Marxist ties, and um, particularly from those kind of medium voters that Labour Party would have gained back under Tony Blair when he came into his leadership in 1997 when they moderated the party. Okay, so the 2019 general election is on the 12th of December, which couldn't really come at a better time for me. Um, so the Labour Party, it's, it's still a little bit unclear on what their platform actually is and whether they're trying to actually go towards more left or trying to actually go towards the more moderate in who they're actually trying to appeal to. Um, Boris Johnson and the others kind of pit um, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour as a very radical, very left. If you actually read their manifestos and what they're proposing to do, um, they aren't that radical at all, really. Um, and I think it's quite... Fitting that they set off their campaign in Battersea, which is a marginal hold. So it appears that maybe they're trying to just hold on to what they were able to achieve in 2017 and not actually set um, a strong discourse as to what sort of who they want to appeal to. Um, and that's similarly with the Brexit case, where, as I said, it's a very partisan, very dividing issue in British society. Um, and they have just kind of pledged to say, we're going to remain neutral and we're going to get a new deal and put it back to the people. So it's again, they're trying to appeal to that younger cohort of, of uh, voters, but also alternatively trying to keep the more traditional working class who voted overwhelm overwhelmingly to leave on board. So it's quite an interesting mix of opinions. Okay, then just very quickly, the German case is the other comparative case study within this research topic. Um, I'm still collecting data from the Germans, but just very quickly, they're going through a very similar identity crisis within the party, don't know who to appeal to. Um, they experienced the same financial crash, obviously, and the problems for the Germans is that they've been in, they had been in coalition with Angela Merkel's CDU for quite some time, um, which means that they have, in a way, backed a lot of these austerity measures, which goes against what social democratic parties are kind of seen or elected to do. Um, in the SPD case, there's very much so a generational split um, between, here's uh, Kevin Kuhnert, who is the youth leader within the SPD, and they very much so advocate for a more leftist platform against the more moderate, so the more pro-business individuals within the SPD party. Okay, so moving forward, they actually just elected two leaders a couple of days ago on the 30th of November. So they elected um, Norbert Walter Borjan and Saskia Esken. 
um, over Olaf Scholz, who was meant to be the favourite, and they were actually the more leftist of the two uh, pictures up there, so it's quite an interesting direction that the SVD is now going in, that they seem to be kind of trying to copy a lot of what Corbyn did in 2017, um, and that puts Angela Merkel's coalition into um, problems because they're coalition sceptics. Um, Okay, so initial findings, yes, so there's both, just blitz in both the parties and questions of electoral dilemma. Um, the test will be able to see in 2019 whether um, Corbyn's policies are Labour Party are able to appeal to both types of individuals who they want to kind of gain that coalition um, of voters for. And then Germany, similarly, will be able to see basically um, through ping and polls and that sort of thing, how successful they will be at trying to replicate some of what well, what I think they will try to replicate some of the things that Jeremy Corbyn did in 2017. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your insightful presentation. Uh, and now, according to our uh, program, we will not have, unfortunately, the second speaker, so instead we'll move on with the third one. Um, so I would like to invite uh, Zafer Ivas. Uh, from environmental gender ecology and he's going to present uh, on proposals and some practices in order to prevent and solve problems arising from individuals of different religions and cultures. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my presentation title is uh, Proposal and Some Practices in Order to Prevent and Solve Problems Arising from Individuals of Different Religions and Culture. First of, first of all, we should know the difference between immigrants' assimilation and integration. Assimilation is only mostly one-way absorption process, whereas integration is a process of providing immigrants with equal sh chances to access opportunities available to native-born. As a desired goal, integration reflects that receiving societies accept them and provide them with equal rights to express their behaviors along with the native born while preserving of their differences. The willingness of immigrants to integrate is not enough. The duty of the receiving societies is to accomplish a work of accepting and integrating them. Integration has been a priority in EU countries, supported at EU level through different concrete measures included in the European Commission's action plan on the integration of third country nationals. The faster migrants are integrated, the better they do and the more they contribute to their Host economies. The integration process has the legal, political, the socio-economic and cultural religious dimensions. Legal political dimension relates to governmental issues, while socio-economic dimension is related both governmental and communal. In this presentation, it will be discussed social and cultural religious dimension which concern both host societies and immigrants. Immigration integration policy in the EU recommends actions such as shared forums, intercultural dialogue and education about immigrant cultures which enhance interaction between immigrants and member state citizens and promote mutual understanding. Commission's Handbook on Integration highlights the role of arts and culture 
in giving a voice to migrants and refugees. The Commission recommended EU financial support to cultural diversity projects through arts and culture. There is an urgent need to find strategies allowing the refugees to be included in European societies while preserving their cultural roots and identity. It is focused on culture as a factor in helping refugees to recover from trauma, develop their skills and feel empowered, as well as contributing to conflict resolution and prevention and mutual understanding. Migration, as you know, a huge asset and challenge within Europe. The key to mastering this challenge would be tolerance. And one task of the cultural institutes is to promote tolerance in the entire society. As you know, integration is an ongoing process rather than a final destination focusing not only on immigrants themselves, but also on the responsibilities of the receiving societies and state authorities. There are a lot of activities regarding integration done by host societies. Among governmental and international activities, there are First, Lisbon Treaty, as you know, that came into force in December of uh, 2009 and articulated the European initiatives to support the policies of member states in the area of immigrant integration. And then, International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrants Workers and Members of Their Families, and United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants. Among committees and programs, there are the Committee on Migration, Refugees and Displaced Persons, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Council of Europe, the Intercultural Cities Program, CONOMAT, the Global Knowledge Partnership on Migration and Development, is a brain trust for the global migration community, IFA, Institute für Auslandsbeziehungen, in Germany's oldest intermediary organization for international cultural relations. Regarding projects, we can add causes and consequences of socio-cultural integration process among new immigrants in Europe, organized by George August University in Germany, nice spaces, uh, Migration, culture, and integration in Europe for supporting community well-being and better integration. Project partners are Netherlands, UK, Germany, Denmark, and Ireland. And we can say some books about this topic. Uh, Cultural Integration of Immigrants in Europe. Handbook of Integration for Policymakers and Practitioners published by European Commission, and International Migration Review is an interdisciplinary journal. There are a lot of research centers across Europe. Migration Policy Center, the European Policy Center, the University of Oxford Center of Migration Policy and Society, and Migration Policy Institute's National Center on Immigration, Immigrant Integration Policy, the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies at Osnabrück University in Germany, and uh, in Spain, the Interdisciplinary Research Group on Immigration of University of Pampo in Fabra in Barcelona. There are a lot of websites uh, good practices in EU, for example, Migration Data Portal, 
European Migration Law is a unique website which offers easy and rapid access to EU law, case laws, and news in the fields of asylum, immigration, and free movement of people. And, and there are financial supports by the European Commission's Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund, Europe for Citizen Program, the Creative Europe Program. There are platforms, councils, consulting offices, forums, working groups, networks, and NGOs. You see here a lot of platforms. And others, Human Rights League, Human Rights Defenders, Expert Council of German Foundation on Integration and Migration, Eurocities Working Group on Migration and Integration, International Migration Integration, and Social Cohesion Network. And we should uh, measure the, if this effort is good or not. Uh, there are indexes and uh, indicators and reports. For example, Eurostat, the Migrant Integration Policy Index, the Migration Governance Indicators, and IOMS World Migration Report. Now, I will tell something about activities regarding <coughs> integration done by guest societies. I would like to give an example, a Gulen moment. Fethullah Gulen is a Turkish Muslim scholar, opinion leader, and peace advocate. He is one of the world's most influential Muslim scholars, the inspiration behind a major transnational civil society movement. According to Gülen, dialogue is not just about overcoming problems of our globalizing world, but is necessitated by our very humanity and his Islamic faith. His la he launched dialogue initiatives first in Turkey, uh, it was in the early 90s that he began particularly advocating the need for dialogue initiatives and organizations. He visited religious and ethnic leaders such as the Patriarch of the Turkish Orthodox Community, the Patriarch of the Turkish Armenian Community, the Chief Rabbi of the Turkish Jewish Community, le uh, the leaders of the Turkish Alevi Community, Pope, John Paul II, and the chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel. Uh, some of Gülen inspired dialogue initiatives and projects worldwide. For example, the International Festival of Language and Culture, charter schools, and cultural centers. And an example from Germany, Forum Dialogue. He made some activities regarding interreligious, interfaith, and Christian Muslim summer schools, Project Human Rights and Religion, Project House of One, Jews, Christians, and Muslims came together in Berlin. There are concerts, festivals, for example, organized dialogue and uh, turquoise harmony in South Africa, organized dialogue and friendship dinners, a concert for refugees, dialogue nams in Latvia, organized Latvian language festival, Balturka, Lithuania, organized poetic umbrella. In the Netherlands, platforms, INS initiated project Art of Living Together, Dialogue Hack London in initiated projects like Nobody is Alone, Youth is Future, 
and Islamic foster parents wanted. And some exam uh, an example from Poland, Dunai Institute Dialogu in Warsaw, Poland, published books, for example, Dialogue, Dialogues of Civilization, Muslim Education, a Pedagogical Vision, vision, of, vision of Fethullah Gülen, organized workshops, Turkish Kitchen, Ebru Art, Music, Learning to Play Ney, Dialogue Conversations, Seminars on Communication Without Violence, Cultural Meetings like Ukrainian, Ukrainian Culture, Conferences, Round Tables, Planting Trees, the International Festival of Language and Culture, Dinners, Christmas dinners, iftar dinners in Ramadan, dinner at festival of sacrifices, luncheon meetings, social evenings, evenings, picnics, visits to the orphanage, football cup, career talks, meetings with neighbors, with mayor, Islam day in the Catholic church, movie nights and language Olympiads. And last example from Poland, Lilia Platforma Kobiat in Warsaw organized meetings about International Day for the Elimination of the Violence Against Women and what can be done against air pollution. As conclusion, I can tell a quote of the Lord Jenkins of Hillhead, who was the president of EC between 1977 and 1981, well explains integration process. I do not regard integration as meaning the loss by immigrants of their own national characteristics and culture. I do not think that we need in, the, in this country, in uh, UK, melting pot, which will turn everybody out in a common mold as one of a series of carbon copies of someone's misplaced vision of the stereotyped Englishman. I define integration, therefore, not a flattening process of assimilation, but as equal opportunity accompanied by cultural diversity in an atmosphere of mutual tolerance. There is consensus that the notion of integration entails a multidimensional and multi-actor process of participation, interaction, and understanding encompassing societies as a whole. Law, tolerance, dialogue, relief, humility, self innovation and to create common spaces for meeting and working together in socially beneficial works are essentials for creating sustainable integration of immigrants. The Gulen movement also plays important role in this regard. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll quickly move, oh you have a presentation, okay. Uh, to the next speech, which will actually continue with the religion as a um, highlight, as a focus of the presentation. Now, uh, one more. Okay. Uh, now the floor is for uh, Janusz Balicki, who is a representative of Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw, um, and given a presentation about the religion the populist discourse regarding the admission of immigrants and refugees from Muslim countries, the case of Central and Eastern Europe. Okay. Um, I, I would like to show only the part of the paper and especially put the accent uh, on the how do religious institutions approach the use of religion on, by populists. Okay, the, it means, uh, I, to, to keep the time, I would try to uh, avoid this introduction, and uh, um, I would uh, explain a little bit what I understand, what 
the books, the publication, understand about the um, populism. Uh, populism is uh, something which is anti-immigration, uh, migration and multiculturalism uh, are threat as the deadly threat to na national culture, social cohesion and traditional uh, style of li life. Uh, populism uh, applying to principle divide and impera um, in the books, you could, we could uh, read that they, they have the tendency to colonize um, the, uh, the state, uh, strengthen the conflict, uh, transforming the state system into soft authoritarianism. Uh, and the, one of, of the definition uh, of the Ivan Krastev, he is a politician uh, from uh, political science uh, from uh, Bulgaria. Um, he, he, he is giving this kind of definition. Populists believe that if you won, won uh, the election, you gain uh, full control over the country, and if you lose, you lose everything. So they rule as if a flood would follow them. And because of that, um, they try to control media, law, uh, constitutional uh, tribunal, and other uh, state institutions. Uh, they don't cooperate with opposition, like, for example, in Switzerland, where uh, opposition and, and the party, which is in, in, in power, try to uh, put together in some important things. Um, th th this is the first slide uh, showing uh, the vast difference across the Europe uh, in public attitude towards uh, Muslims. Uh, people uh, had to answer the question who would say would be uh, willing to accept Muslims uh, as members of their family. And we, we see the, the situation. When we think about religion, religion is something uh, which uh, should uh, put uh, gather the people, to put them uh, with the love to uh, other uh, nation. It means uh, the fear uh, about strangers is something against the uh, basic Christianity uh, the rules. And uh, uh, we have the convenience, uh, we are convinced that the, we are the best uh, Christians, uh, but this part of Europe is, is very bad. Uh, but uh, look, uh, the attitude uh, to accepting the people from different religions is completely different. Um, it means uh, the Western Europe looks much better than Eastern Europe. Uh, Poland has the first, uh, is on the first place accepting the statement all further migration from mainly Muslim countries should be stopped. Uh, Poland, uh, this is interesting uh, slide, is showing that uh, 56 uh, percent of people would resign with their funds not accepting Muslims, and even to leave European Union, 51, uh, if uh, they had to uh, accept uh, Muslims. This is the Hungary. Um, you could, no, <laughs> that's for me very funny way of question uh, people. Do you agree that the government, that instead of uh, allocating funds to migration, we should support Hungarian families, uh, the, those children yet to be born? Uh, we should do uh, this one and another one as well. Slovakia, uh, is, uh, Czech Republic. Yeah, I will not read this, uh, some uh, slogans from, I think, Slovakia or Czech. Republic. Yeah, and this is Poland. This is Warsaw, uh, 2017, uh, our independent days. And this is the reaction of uh, Al Jazeera and uh, New York Times uh, for what happened in, in Warsaw. You could read. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this, again, from this parade. 2017, uh, Trojan horses, anti-Islam slogans, and uh, somebody uh, is reminding us uh, that uh, you know, Muslims are human beings, and uh, during the war, uh, Polish people were welcomed 
without any racial discrimination in Muslim lands. Uh, it, as we know, it is about the people who left Siberia. Our message is clear, we are all humans, we are all the same. Um, These are examples from Narjennik. Narjennik is the uh, Radio Maria, part of Radio Maria. Uh, it is some kind of church in, in, in the Catholic Church in, in, in Poland. Uh, this Radio Maria is, uh, is supporting the government. Uh, I, I would not show uh, the, some pictures with dancing of the government and Father Rizik and other things, uh, but uh, in, in this newspaper we see uh, some statements, uh, even a professor uh, about the Islam, uh, not, not very pleasant. It is, again, completely different than uh, church's teaching, this uh, Vatican Second Council or the Pope Francis. Uh, we will go very quickly. Um, this is a statement of Father Maciej Jemba uh, in, in translation, Shameful Wood. It also reflects how quickly Christians in Poland allowed themselves to adopt the language of politicians, sociology, politics, sociology, and ideology when describing the problem of refugees, thus rejecting the religious description of the reality. Uh, it means uh, he, this, he, Father Dominikanin, uh, he is surprised what happened in Poland that in this uh, Christian country, 90, uh, more than 90 people belonging to the church uh, could <laughs> thinking not according to the gospel, but according to this political or so sociological. Uh, uh, way of, of thinking. Uh, these are some pictures showing uh, this, uh, populist uh, politicians. Uh, this is um, Salvini from uh, Italy who visited our country. Uh, this is uh, Salvini in Hungary. Uh, this is uh, the, this populist po politicians uh, in the Western Europe, in, uh, France, uh, Holland, uh, together. Uh, this is the, uh, Poland, uh, as, uh, as you know, uh, at least the Polish people know that we have the very famous old and very precious for us sanctuary in Częstochowa. And uh, uh, these are uh, right wings. Uh, movements, uh, uh, nationalists, uh, trying to, to do this kind of events in, in this, for us, the holy, holy place. And uh, this is a so-called pilgrimage of uh, young people to Jasna Gura, 2017. Uh, Salvini, uh, some pictures, he's keeping the gospel. Uh, uh, he is responsible for the dead, many people who could not um, reach Italy. And he is keeping the gospel in his hand. Uh, uh, here he is keeping the rosary. Uh, this is in the Polish uh, uh, text. Uh, uh, this uh, Italian bishop, Domenico Magiavero, in strong words, criticized uh, him because of that. Because it is the evidence using um, the religion uh, for own purpose, the political purpose. Uh, I, I cannot understand uh, as a believer that somebody uh, thinking that the political power is more important for him than uh, religious values. And he, he should know this against the, the gospel. Uh, here is the number, uh, we see the number of people who died uh, uh, since 2014-2018, uh, trying to come uh, to Europe. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, the number is almost close to, no, it's, it's uh, about 19,000. Uh, the, the Pope uh, Francis, he, he wrote a letter uh, in, uh, in this year about migrants, refugees, and uh, he, was, he wrote a letter against, the, uh, again, uh, uh, sorry, he wrote the, uh, the letter as well if, uh, about the Europe, about people who live in, in Europe, because it is a challenge for us. 
uh, we see people dying, uh, trying to come to Europe. And you know, if we are human beings, we, we, we cannot allow for something like this. Uh, uh, this is something which does uh, the title about the uh, situation in Greece. Uh, I was uh, last uh, week in Greece, in Athens. There was a conference organized by um, the Holy See, and there were many people very interesting. But being in Greece, I decided uh, to go to Lesbos to see the, the Moria camp, and very famous. And uh, we see it's a lot, a lot, you can find in the internet, a lot of information. I will go very quickly. That's both more, I come, I see what happened when a child loses their hope. Uh, they are, even children are com uh, committing suicide. Uh, they are, there, is, uh, there are about uh, 13,000 uh, of people. There are two camps, I'll show a little bit later. Oh. Uh, this is a, a, a more uh, Lesbos, yeah. Uh, um, this, and uh, this is the picture uh, showing the camp uh, f from from the, the earth. Uh, there are two camps. This is official, and this is not official. It means the tents uh, people are living. Uh, I know that there are five thousand children in, in this uh, the second camp. Uh, no, this is the picture. With the, and uh, I was doing these pictures. And uh, here we see the official camp. This is uh, not official. Uh, and uh, people living in the tents. Uh, the tents, which is big, like this, a little bigger, uh, lived, uh, five uh, families lived, lived there with children. For many months, some of them even a year, oh, this is the condition how people are living there. Uh, school for children. Uh, uh, you see uh, the situation about these tents. This is a uh, uh, young boy uh, on, the, on this floor, as you can see, uh, called the floor. This surface. And uh, uh, two ladies, they are from Afghanistan. When I ask this one uh, uh, how they could cope with the situation, and, and she said, uh, we do because of, of the better future to our children. Yeah? It means uh, that she believed that um, the children uh, eventually would have a better uh, future. Uh, the, the cooking dinner, uh, children, camps, and uh, no, it's, uh, it's pity maybe you don't see how, uh, how wet it was, how difficult to, to walk uh, on, on this place, how, uh, yeah, how uh, trying to, uh, to dry the um, uh, uh, the, the, the for children, yeah. And uh, this is very moving. This is from internet. Uh, this is a story of, of uh, one lady, and uh, uh, and I will go. Oh, this is something which uh, uh, is uh, written. Uh, what said one, one resident of Moria, where are the human rights, where is the European Union, why they don't know about this human crisis that we have in Moria. Uh, and this is the uh, artist, I'll show you some his picture. Um, this is uh, very uh, moving and interesting. Uh, the, uh, as you know, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Uh, uh, and this one, uh, the idea that some lives uh, matter less is the root cause of all that is wrong with the world. Uh, and. Uh, if you, he puts uh, some uh, picture together, I think, to, to make this thinking, 
uh, Merry Christmas and, and this uh, situation. Uh, church teaching about Islam, uh, very quickly. Uh, the Pope uh, is, uh, first of all, uh, you can read, uh, uh, he is speaking to refugees. You experience of pain and hope reminds us that we are all strangers and pilgrimage on the earth, welcome by some uh, with generosity and without any merit. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you can read it to the end. Uh, too many times you have not been welcome, forgive the closer uh, and indifference of our society that fears the change in, in lifestyle. It's, it's very moving as well, if you read to the end. Uh, and uh, it is good to remember uh, that uh, Vatican Second Council is, was speaking about Muslims as a, a people who, whose root the, uh, religion is from Abraham, they are uh, referring to Old Testament, uh, and they uh, treat Jesus as a prophet. And uh, it means uh, if you confront uh, this kind of uh, Vatican Second Council, which is uh, obligation for the Catholics, with the Nasz Dziennik, Radio Maria, this statements, would you see that? You, 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 we can understand what happened. Uh, uh, and this picture is showing uh, the activity of the Pope Francis, uh, who tried to meet uh, leaders of uh, Muslims, uh, countries, and, and to, to talk about terrorism and other things. And both sides agree that, that religion cannot uh, accept this kind of activity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for the panelists, for their presentations, and we have very little time, but if you have any question, uh, you have, we have the right only for one question before we go for the lunch break. Okay, then you prefer to speak uh, individually. You're also welcome to do so. So now we are going to have a lunch break, and then we'll see you in the next sessions. Thank you very much.
Ja w ogóle muszę powiedzieć, że dla mnie, no oczywiście przygnębiające wrażenie zrobił sam Ogrodem, bo przed miesiąc byłam w Antariuszku, udzielałam pomocy prawnej, ale sama ta szkoła była takim... Tak, ale ta szkoła była takim światełkiem w tunelu nadziei, powiedziałabym. Że sami uchodźcy zorganizowali sobie tak, tak, tak. szkołę, zajęcia dla dzieciaków i tak dalej, także to było bardzo, bardzo fajne, że to, to, to wróciłem w kontakcie, bo to jak tak. byśmy ludzie robili tam te na, na Facebooku jakąś tam czy seminarium, czy coś takiego, mm. to tam mogła też być. Bardzo chętnie. No. Ja zresztą teraz jestem na Uniwersytecie Warszawskim w Szkole Dekubarskiej, także i tą tematyką się zajmuję uchodźczą. No, co prawda z punktu widzenia pracy, ale 